In 410, calamity struck the Roman Empire. Oh, horror. The world is collapsing in ruins. The renowned city, the capital of the Roman Empire, is destroyed in one tremendous fire. If Rome can perish, what can be safe? St. Jerome. The barbarian Goths had swept over from the east and sacked the city of Rome. For some Christians, now widely established throughout the empire, this indicated apocalypse, the end of the world. For others, it was a sign that the city and its institutions were finished. It was a time to seek other, cleaner horizons. In the fifth century, Christianity returned to the desert and to other wild places. The call of Christ, as we all read it in the Gospel, is a call to purity of heart, to single-mindedness in the service of God. And Christians began to feel very deeply that to respond to that call is actually very difficult if you're involved in the world, if you're pursuing a career, if you've got a family to look after. And so the ascetical movement developed and taught people that to respond to the call of Christ fully, it was necessary to renounce all these worldly things, not to pursue a worldly career, not to marry and have a family, to renounce wealth. Blessed is he who lives the solitary life and keeps apart from those who walk the earth, but lifts his thoughts always towards God. Gregory of Nazianzus. Up till now, Christianity's emphasis had been on community. It had been one of its essential and appealing qualities. The social group, the church, had been its most important unit. Now some dedicated Christians felt they had to find or rediscover a private route to God. The place to do it was in the wilderness, the way to deny the body and so nourish the soul. These were the ideas that would guide the 5th century's most influential Christians. A hundred years earlier, Antony of Egypt had been the first to travel into the desert and live alone as a hermit. Anthony of Egypt is one of the great pioneers of the desert movement, and he describes how he was sitting in church one day with his uh, sister and heard the words of Jesus, sell all that you have and give everything and, and follow me. He literally followed those words, gave up everything, and went and lived among the tombs and sought by himself to find a way to God, a direct way to God through direct access by confronting the forces of evil and the forces of, uh, of, of the divine Holy Spirit out in the desert. In this, Antony was imitating the spiritual odyssey of Christ himself, who in his 40 days in the wilderness rejected the temptations of the world and the flesh and triumphed over Satan. Others followed Antony's example and a small movement grew up. Initially there was great scepticism um, by the authorities and the public at large. And St. John Chrysostom describes how in Antioch of his day, uh, people would boast how they'd track down hermits uh, and organize parties to beat them up. And so they were clearly sort of weird and, and sort of freakish characters to the townspeople of the late Roman Empire. And only gradually did their appeal spread. But spread it did through Egypt, through the deserts of Judea, where John the Baptist had prophesied, and through the unforgiving landscapes of Asia Minor. This is Cappadocia in present-day Turkey. Here, hermits dug out retreats in the volcanic rock. Many were persuaded to choose a solitary life. And so henceforth there arose monasteries even in the mountains, and the desert was made a city by monks coming out of their own and enrolling themselves in the heavenly citizenship. Athanasius. In times to come, the life of the desert hermits would be idealized as in these late 14th century paintings. The reality in the 5th century was that life was extremely harsh. That was the idea. 
What was important to the early monks was not so much the appeal of the desert as so much as its lack of appeal, the fact that it was so very difficult living there. And uh, the idea was th a deliberate um, self-punishment, punishing the body so as to relieve the soul. Some holy men took asceticism to even greater extremes. You have these figures in the Syrian desert who are suspended from cages, um, standing on pillars, and devising new and novel methods of, of punishing themselves. And it became a sort of almost a competitive thing. Some ascetics even denied themselves cage or cell, choosing to survive in the open. The most celebrated was Simeon Stylites, who from 422 till his death in 459 lived on top of a column completely exposed. And there he was all the time on top of this column. There was no shelter, no roof, no tent, exposed to the elements. In the summer, from the intense glare of the sun, he sometimes lost his eyesight. In winter, he must have been covered with snow. On this column, he stood all the time, either praying to God with his hands stretched out, or addressing the crowds below, or speaking to individuals who wished to consult him. Paradoxically, in withdrawing from society, Simeon had drawn it to him. The extraordinary thing about Simeon's stylites to his um, contemporaries was quite how popular he was. I mean, to us, he seems this very, very bizarre figure, this, this sort of holy freak show. But at the time, there's a, a real sense that this man had somehow bridged the divide between the human and the divine. He'd worn away the curtain which separated the human um, from, from the godly. And, so, and therefore, he'd become like a sort of ambassador. He was God's ambassador and representative on earth. And he could take the petitions of the people up to heaven. He was a kind of go-between. The established church recognized that this alternative route to the divine was a challenge to its authority and responded by either condemning the ascetics as heretics or trying to bring them into the fold. The man mainly responsible for bringing monks in from the wilderness was the Bishop Basil of Caesarea. Basil puts a lot of emphasis on mutual service within the community. He's not keen on the ideal of the hermit. Although the hermit is seen in Egypt very often as the ideal Christian, and in Syria too, Basil is very, very skeptical, in, if not indeed cynical, about hermits, and tends to think of people who want to go off and live alone as people who want to slip away from the obligations of the common life. And one of his most quoted sayings about that is, if you live alone, whose feet will you wash? Basil set up monasteries in towns where the monks were involved in helping the poor and sick. They lived communally under a system of rules which still underpins some monastic orders today. Out of the monastic system emerged a figure whose ideas would shape Christianity, for good or ill, in all the centuries to follow, Augustine. He came from a comfortable family in North Africa. Famously, he once said, give me chastity, but not yet. Augustine had been familiar with and troubled by the pleasures of the flesh before converting. In his confessions, he wrote, From the muddy concupiscence of the flesh and the hot imagination of puberty, mists steamed up to cloud and darken my heart so that I could not distinguish the white light of love from the fog of lust. Both love and lust boiled within me. After his conversion, Augustine lived the ascetic life in a small community before going to Hippo in North Africa, where he became a priest and eventually a bishop. He didn't leave his ascetical ideals behind him. He himself and his clergy lived together in a clerical monastery that he created where everything, even items of clothing, were shared in common. And in teaching the faithful, the ideal of Christianity he put before them was really a monastic one. 
Soon after the sack of Rome, Augustine wrote The City of God, which introduced the tension between earthly and divine values. Augustine developed a long analysis of two cities, the city of God, which is the community of people who truly love God and are chosen by God ultimately to join the saints in heaven, and the earthly city made up of people who love self first and seek happiness in this world. And the church, though it contains both types of people, because not all Christians truly put God first, nevertheless manifests on earth the heavenly city. More far-reaching were Augustine's views on the nature of sin. There were Christians in the fifth century, very traditionally minded, who said human sin is a matter of the will. It's a matter of choosing the evil instead of the good. And if you are baptized, particularly, you have that freedom to choose the good and turn away from evil. It has to do with the will. Augustine, on the other hand, taught a radically different teaching. He, he taught that the will is intrinsically dis, uh, diseased, if you like, and that its disease goes back to our very formation as human beings in bodies, that, that, that we were born in sin, and that because in fact, original sin, he thinks, occurred with Adam and is transmitted actually genetically through the human species. It's tr transmitted, he said, through semen. Here it was. Sex. The pagans had always worshipped fertility. The classical world had revered the beauty of the human body. Eroticism was natural and celebrated. Now, following Augustine, Christianity would connect sex with sin, guilt and damnation, the body with corruption. The whole of her bodily beauty is nothing less than phlegm, blood, bile and the fluid of digested food. If you consider what is stored up behind those lovely eyes, the angle of the nose, the mouth and the cheeks, you will agree that the well-proportioned body is merely a whitened sepulchre. St. John Chrysostom. For St. Augustine, original sin and the fracture of mankind is written on the body, written in its curious functions, written in its privacy. With St. Augustine, we move away from the celebration of the body, so central to classical culture, so central to its sculpture and its art, to hiding the body, moving from a culture of celebration to a culture of shame. St. Augustine is key to the way even now we think about our own bodies and still, to a certain extent, seek to hide them from a public gaze. For Augustine, sex was only permissible in the confines of a Christian marriage. In marriage, certainly, sex is legitimate. It can even be something really rather positive. What he will not let go of is the idea that it is always infected by the corruption of greed. And so it's only when it is sanctified by marriage and directed to the procreation of children that, it, that, that the balance works out that we're in favor of sex rather than no sex. If you look at Augustine's view of marriage, he speaks of the, the best marriage is, is, a, is exemplified by the paradigm of Mary and Joseph. It has fidelity, it has sacrament, and it has offspring, and par parenthetically, no sex. Augustine admired Christ's mother, Mary, because she conceived without sex. That meant Jesus was born without original sin. Mary had, of course, been a figure in the Gospels, but she'd never had a significant identity. Now, in the fifth century, she was to become an example for women throughout the Christian world. The cult of the Virgin was promoted by a sister of the emperor in Constantinople, Pulcheria, who built a church in the city to house the relics of the Virgin's robe and girdle. It's largely due to Pulcheria's efforts that the Virgin Mary reaches such prominence in the fifth century. 
Poker, in a sense, stands as an expression of the rise of a new female element in Christianity centered on the Virgin Mary, and particularly centered on her ascription as Theotokos, the mother of God, Christ bearer. Christians had puzzled for centuries over whether or how Christ could be both man and God. Now the issue resurfaced in the question of whether Mary, as Christ's mother, could be effectively the mother of God. A bishop, Nestorius, said not. And again, controversy flared. If you believe that in Jesus of Nazareth there's a divine and a human person side by side, then it's quite clear that Mary is the mother of the human bit. So you couldn't use mother of God to describe Mary. She is the mother of the human being in whom the Son of God dwelt. But Nestorius's opponents said, but you can't separate the divine and the human in quite that way. And the person to whom Mary gives birth is the person of Christ, the eternal Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Humanly speaking, Mary is the mother of God. A council was called at Ephesus, where Paul had once preached against the pagan gods. It confirmed that Mary could be considered the mother of God. Once the Council of Ephesus had settled on the term mother of God for Mary, that of course was a great triumph for the way in which the cultus of the Virgin Mary was developing. Now Mary was established as a kind of queen mother, an influential member of the heavenly court. In centuries to come, she would be venerated as the most approachable and effective intermediary in Christianity. She would also be a powerful role model for women within the church. <laughs>